girls speaking English. I don't yes. Know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, panel on using the power of science, the channel, the challenge ahead, is jointly organized by the World Economic Forum and the World Institute of Science. I will be the moderator of this session. I'm an organic chemist. I worked uh, in computer graphics at MIT, molecular graphics, for quite a while, and then I headed the applied research of the Institut Pasteur for 10 years. The participants on this panel, by alphabetic order, are Werner Arber, Professor of Microbiology, University of Basel, Switzerland, Nobel Laureate, and since October 96, the President of ICSU, which is the International Council of Scientific Unions. Ludwig Fadeyev, is a member of the Presidium of the Russian Academy of Science, Steklov, Mathematical Institute in Russia, is not Nobel Laureate, not yet. Uh, it was printed wrongly in your programs, I say not yet. Uh, however, the mathematicians don't really have Nobel Prize, but he's a physicist too, so maybe he went in one day. Samuel Hellman is Professor at the Department of Radiation and Cellular Oncology at the University of Chicago, USA. John Polanyi, Professor of Chemistry, University of Toronto, Canada, is a Nobel Laureate. And Sir Martin Rees, Professor of Cosmology, Institute of Astronomy, University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. I will try to open by a few remarks and then give you the two questions which, were the, which are the basis of the presentation that each of the scientists will make. I think there is a crisis in science today. Certainly science is building the knowledge society of the future and there are so many positive results that you know. But I think that science is living through three major crises. The first one, I call it a crisis of confidence. Confidence between the scientific community, the politicians, the public, the experts. We've seen it recently in many occasions where the experts, the media, the public and the politicians had contradictory positions on key issues like contaminated blood for instance and what should have been done to avoid that disaster in many countries like this uh, very difficult case of the prion with the mad cow disease or the problem raised by nuclear energy and the accidents of which happened in Europe. Crisis of confidence first. A crisis of relevance of public funding of research. Where should the priority be put? On fundamental physics research, on biology, on application of those sciences for industry, for the public, who decides where to put the priorities? And because that the scientific disciplines are so fragmented, because it is so difficult to understand what should be put forward and what should be left aside, there is, I believe, a crisis of relevance of the public funding of research. And finally, I think also there is a crisis of communication. Science has become so complex, disciplines have mushroomed so much, that even scientists don't know the shared knowledge that they, uh, they, they have together. Many scientists don't understand the field of the next door scientist. And what about the public? What about the politician? What about the decision makers and the industrialists understanding what's going on? Who is going to do some synthesis from time to time to show the trends and to lead the way? So this is as a background that I wanted to put the three questions. And the, 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 the major questions that are asked to the scientists to answer in their papers, I will just read them to you so you have a very precise framework. And if some of them will try to answer that in six minutes. The first one is, what do you see as the key scientific issue that will need to be addressed by scientists in your field as we move into the 21st century? 
And the second one is how can the scientific community cooperate with the political and business communities to ensure that the public interest is served. We have the chance to have on this panel a representation of all the basic science, from mathematics to physics, astronomy, chemistry, biology, and medicine. It's a rare occasion to have a panel which really is so representative of the fundamental sciences. And I hope that in your question later, and you have about half an hour to raise your question, we will have time to answer your question and discuss between us. So I will first give the floor to uh, Professor Werner Arber, uh, uh, as I told you, President, Professor of Microbiology at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Okay, thank you. Since the middle of this century, biology, biological sciences have taken really a new impulse. And this is due to the introduction of new methodology and research strategies. Thanks to this, it is possible to go a step lower in the uh, on the level of the molecules which are actually guiding the life processes. While for a long time biology was rather a descriptive phenomenon, it has become an experimental phenomenon at the level of the bioactive molecules. And it is thanks to this that already now a richness in new insights in processes, in knowledge on mechanisms by which life processes occur has been reached. It is thanks to the further progress that we can expect that many more new discoveries will be made, that we will more and more deeply understand the processes of many of the life interactions. It is clear to me and to many of my colleagues that by this kind of dissection into smaller and smaller pieces and looking at specific reactions, we have to be careful not to miss the integrative uh, step afterwards in order to really see how life expect, ex expands as well and on the level of the individuals as on the level of the populations. So uh, we have a difficult task in front of us, but it is clear that uh, within the next decades there will be many, many more discoveries. Now, uh, it is important that we also consider the level of the applications. Uh, I think the technological applications are obvious to all of those present here, and I do not need to stress how important applications of new knowledge can become in the field of biomedicine. It is also very important to acquire new knowledge in the management of the environment so that we can responsibly uh, really carry the development of the human society all by protecting the environment uh, and trying not to further its degradation. And I'm sure that new knowledge on life processes both individual lives and the evolutionary development of populations can contribute to this. Now, as far as the question is concerned, how do we deal with the politicians, with the economics, with the general public? I think it is important that for any applications, the purpose has to be clearly defined and if one goes to applications, one should 
make the appropriate technology assessment with all the competence we can mobilize in order to foresee uh, how an application will later on, uh, what will be the, rep the, the, the consequences of, of, of any applications. Now, for me, I think it is as important to see applications on our world view, namely on the understanding of nature by all of us, by the general public, and that should go into education. There are many new aspects which haven't penetrated at that level yet, and it is a common task of all of us uh, to really deliberate uh, with, each, with, with the appropriate public and find out what that means for our life. Where do we come from? Where are we going to? What are our, are our responsibilities towards nature, which we will understand uh, better and better? And we have to use this knowledge. Now, the scientific communities have had discussions with these uh, motivation since quite a long time and I just would like to mention three institutions which are deeply involved in these questions. Many more uh, institutions could be mentioned but time is lacking. Let me start with the ICSU, which is the International Council of Scientific Unions, which groups about 25 disciplines, unions of disciplines, scientific disciplines, and it groups about 90 national organizations, mostly academies. And within ICSU, uh, there are very interesting programs particularly where it comes to interdisciplinary work between the different disciplines. Uh, ICSU is a non-governmental organization, and so is what the chairman has mentioned, the World Institute of Science, which has been only relatively recently founded. It has actually about 100 members recruited worldwide. And the intention of the World Institute of Science is uh, precisely to deal with the questions which are here treated about on the podium. Another institution is a governmental one, which we all know, which is UNESCO. And UNESCO has started very recently an initiative to give a little bit more emphasis on science, sciences, as a part of the cultural activities of the human societies. And it is within these different groupings and, this and, and, and organizations that I do see the very important interdisciplinary task that the problems which we are faced with are identified, discussed, and then integrated in our worldview. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for stressing the risks of reductionism, the need for integration, and the necessity for evaluation of the consequences of application through those uh, institutions. May I remind the panelists that there is a strange robot over here, which uh, there is a light coming up, a red light, just leaving you one minute. But that's, that was perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Ludwig Fedeyev. <clears throat> I represent here the of physics and mathematics. So my answer to the first question about uh, what could be the main results in the near future, this answer will consist of two parts. First, about physics. Let me remind you that physics is a natural science with just one goal, unraveling the structure of an un living matter. In the first half of the century, physics had enormous advance with the advent of relativity, quantum principles, and Einstein theory of gravitation. All this development are connected also with three famous fundamental constants, velocity of light, Planck constant, and uh, gravitational constant which comes into Einstein equations. These three constants fix 
three dimensions about which you have learned in high school, namely dimensions of time, mass, and length. Unfortunately, this development until now are not united. And we believe, physicists believe, many of my colleagues do it, that as soon as we will unite gravity, which until now plays a role in cosmology mostly, or in our, <laughs> our everyday life, and uh, when we unite gravitation and quantum principles, we will find final theory of elementary particles, and then physics somehow will get its fundamental base. Apparently, this goal will, be, will not be solved in the final four years of this millennium, uh, and so it will come to the next century. Mathematics is quite different. Mathematics is not a natural science. It's a product of uh, human brain, in a way. And it has no definite course and developed by its own laws. The role of mathematics in natural science, uh, one of them, and very important role, is that of language. Uh, in this way, it somehow gives us a sixth sense. For instance, you cannot say what color is of an electron, how it smells, how you can touch it, it's too small. But you can describe it by means of mathematics. And this is a fundamental role of mathematics in natural sciences, especially in physics where it comes very far, but I'm sure that in biology, which is the main science of next century, it will play also a very prominent role. Now to the second question. To answer it, I want first to comment a little bit on the nature of fundamental science. I believe that uh, our activity reflects the strife of human being for knowledge, for explanation of unknown. In this respect, uh, scientists belong to a community of creative peoples, uh, this, the same community where artists or um, musicians come. But unfortunately, our results are understandable only to a very narrow uh, group of professionals. You can discuss among mathematicians how beautiful this theorem is, but you cannot explain it to more <laughs> wild public why it is so beautiful. Uh, so in this lies, of course, the defenselessness of fundamental science. Another distinction from other creative uh, uh, activity is the fact that fundamental science is a base for technological research and development. It's a strong part of it, and it's also a weak part of it, because uh, enormous pressure of uh, industry just presses scientists to do maybe what they would like to do if they were completely free. But history proved that uh, fundamental science certainly leads to many important innovations, and I believe there is no reason to think that it will not continue in the future. Scientists give their results to society completely free. Their enumeration is just their salary. If Maxwell equations, which are base of electricity, radio, X-ray, just to mention a little bit of it, were patented, or if Schrodinger equation, which is a base of all chemistry, was patented, I think it would pay for fundamental science forever. But we certainly don't do it. And so this, we believe that society must understand it also, and its attitude to fundamental science must be that of belief that our results are relevant, and we are doing most honestly our everyday work. So uh, I believe that uh, if scientists will continue honestly do their work, and society will believe in the relevance of fundamental science, uh, this contact will enable us to continue. Thank you. Thank you. So I understand we will have to wait a little bit more for the unified equation of the universe. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the Maxwell equation would have been patented. Probably we wouldn't have uh, cellular phones because somebody would have uh, kept it uh, for long and, and not, uh, <laughs> not release it as well <laughs> in time. Uh, now we're going to move to medicine with Samuel Hellman, uh, Professor of uh, Radiation in the Department of Radiation and Cellular Oncology. Thank you very much. In the United States, most of the talk about medicine is about healthcare reform, uh, 
questions of uh, how we're changing our practice in medicine. I'm convinced, however, that if we look back on this decade, healthcare reform, even in the United States, will be a weak third. The first two issues of real importance to us are the AIDS pandemic and the biologic revolution. Let me first uh, make a comment about the AIDS pandemic. Uh, those of you who are here uh, and heard President Mandela, you heard the magnitude of it uh, eloquently described and the staggering numbers. Um, there's a good side to this story, and the, sto the good side, in my judgment, is that we became aware of this around 1980. By 1985 or so, one of our fellow at attendees, Luc Montagnier, uh, had discovered the cause of the disease, um, the viral cause of the disease. We now, this year, have embarked on what most would agree is effective therapy. That's very impressive indeed, but as uh, President Mandela pointed out, uh, it is no solution to the AIDS pandemic. There is no way we are going to adequately be able to treat all the people currently infected, never mind uh, those in the future. The only hope uh, is to develop preventive measures, and on the horizon, the most likely preventive measures uh, will be vaccines. Vaccine science is an applied science. It is not fundamental science. If we put enough resources into this one and enough effort into this one, I strongly believe we can move the time to an effective vaccine. Now the second point, the biologic revolution. We've heard my, my, the two previous speakers talk about the power of biology in the next century uh, was suggested as the, as the century of biology. Uh, I would suggest to you that this is a time of discontinuity. This is a major saltation, a major change in the way we think. A lot of people have associated this uh, and made uh, comparisons with physics in the 1920s with the development of quantum mechanics. I don't believe that captures it fully. I would compare it with the industri Industrial Revolution. It will change how we act as human beings, how we live, how we consider life itself. Now, we, the conversations at this meeting and at elsewhere have focused on what I believe is just the tip of the iceberg, but it's a very big tip. And those are concerned with the problems with understanding the genes and manipulating the genes. Um, with the first part, questions of how society deals with this information. With the second part, do we believe that we can fashion or should fashion uh, characteristics, uh, human characteristics? These are huge, huge questions, but they are here. They are here. There are even, in my judgment, more substantial scientific uh, possibilities below the surface. Um, there is no doubt that there is a biologic program that is concerned with senescence and aging. If there is a biologic program concerned with it, it offers opportunities for manipulation. That is a huge thing to think about. Uh, prolongation of meaningful existence. And I'm not talking about nursing home existence. I'm talking about important, meaningful, active existence. That's a change in how we look at our species. It's of such fundamental importance. We need, obviously, to determine what kinds of common views, common values we have, so that we can direct how these advances can best be used. I, I was writing here just to give some metaphors for this, because there's no going back. Um, the genie is out of the bottle. We have tasted of the apple, and uh, the Garden of Eden is over. This is a place where ignorance is not bliss. We cannot afford ignorance. We really must understand this, and we need to develop guidelines consonant with shared human values. So we need shared human values explicated. We need guidelines which aren't 
national. They have to transcend it because science transcends it. Uh, and uh, we need to develop a strong enough political structure to actually be sure that these are implemented. So my pleasure in being here is that I believe most of these kinds of discussions that I have had have been with my medical colleagues. And unfortunately, they are not the ones that are able to develop these shared values nor to implement the political will to have uh, a reasonable control of this. But I urge you, because I believe you are the right audience for this, to think hard about this and not to think we don't want it, because that's not an option. It's here. It's how we handle it. Thank you very much. It is clear that the enormous programs of research and aid on one hand and on the genome project on the other hand has also opened new avenues and new routes to linked sciences like immunology, immunity, senescence, aging, and uh, cell development and death. And uh, the results of this are going, I agree with you, extraordinary, but needs responsibility and uh, ethics. And I hope that during the question response session we'll have time to address this very important question of bioethics. Now we move to physical chemistry. It's being said chemistry in the program, but I'm an organic chemist, you're a physical chemist, so there's a difference. So it's physical chemistry, and uh, John Polanyi, professor of chemistry at the University of Toronto and Nobel laureate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to say doesn't seem to bear very closely on physical chemistry. Uh, I want to talk about an aspect of the power of science which we haven't really brought into focus yet. Let me say at the outset that uh, several of us on this platform might begin our remarks by thanking the Swedish people for uh, transforming what was purely a prize in science into what is supposedly an indication of wisdom. Alfred Nobel, who endowed those prizes I'm referring to, was an explosives manufacturer. He was a businessman who would have fitted in beautifully at this meeting, except for the fact that he was a recluse. Um, his business was enormously successful. It was global in its scope. How impressive, then, to learn that what it was that he, Nobel, uh, most valued in science. If you look at his will, you'll find that his prizes were to be awarded above all for work exhibiting idealistic writing, which is uh, idealistic tendencies. Well, of the substantial number of uh, businessmen, politicians, and scientists uh, gathered here, how many would claim to value science principally for its idealistic tendencies? Very few. In the few minutes I have, I want to put it to you that Nobel was right in his evaluation. Science hardly needs saying, has benefited us materially, it's lengthened our lives, it's enriched our existence by teaching us about ourselves. But its greatest gift is its ideals. The ideals of science are to be found in a shared commitment to truth. All else, such as personal ambition or uh, nationalist uh, enthusiasms, are secondary. The truth of a scientific proposition, to put it differently, uh, is not judged by scientists according to the race, the religion, the nationality, the class, color, or gender of the individual who makes that scientific proposition. And this is what makes science a civilized and therefore a civilizing influence. Of course, I don't want to suggest that the primacy of truth is something that's unique to science. Those same values underlie 
civilized debate of the sort we've been having here uh, and civilized debate in every walk of life. What makes it so important that these ideals lie at the center of science is that science itself is central to our age. And that's why, just to give an example, throughout the bleakest years of Stalinism, the Soviet Academy of Science was able to maintain some independence of the state. In the wake of Stalin's death, Khrushchev spoke of the need to rebuild society on a basis of truth. The first to feel in a position to answer his call were, I think, the scientists, for the reason I just stated, and most notably among them, Andrei Sakharov, who arguably contributed as much as uh, Mr. Gorbachev to the collapse of communism. Joseph Stalin uh, is alleged to have once asked uh, scornfully, how many divisions has the Pope? How many divisions has the Pope? Uh, Sakharov, who was such an influential figure, didn't even have the Swiss Guard. His power came from the same source as that of the Chinese astrophysicist Fong Lizhi, whose calm and unrelenting questioning of the present Chinese leadership set the stage for the protests of June 1989 in Tiananmen Square. The government of China awarded Dr. Fong the highest recognition, the top place on their most wanted list. I'm underscoring here, and I make an attempt to summarize, the existence of an important international community with shared ideals, the scientific community. I think of it as potentially a powerful NGO, if you like, non-governmental organization, and I would wish it to behave as such. It's exceptional in its power, and also in the degree to which it, throughout history, has operated as an international body. I don't uh, mean to say that scientists have not been operating this way. They have, particularly in the last 40 years. Uh, you've heard of the Pugwash conferences on science and world affairs. They attempt to exploit the existence of this community. Their success in doing so was recognized by the award of the Nobel Peace Prize a year and a half ago. The point that I'm making here is that this type of thinking that led to the Pugwash conferences can be extended well beyond the technical and has been to include human rights, which are so clearly fundamental to the pursuit of science, as I've been stressing, and even beyond that, to uh, the offering of assistance uh, through the scientific community to countries such as Bosnia at the moment, where people are struggling to build democracy. With that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning wisdom and truth as a balance of power seekers in science. But I would like to discuss and argue maybe the civilized influence of science. It definitely is a civilized influence. Otherwise, if it's distorted, distorted by other powers, and we might discuss that a bit later. Now, the last speaker, Sir Martin Rees, opens up to cosmology. I'm going to start off by going back to the 17th century when the philosopher Francis Bacon highlighted three astonishing discoveries. Gunpowder, silk, and the mariner's compass. These things, he wrote, were not discovered by the arts of reason, but by chance. They are, he said, different in kind, so that no preconceived notion could possibly have conduced to their discovery. It was Bacon's belief that there are still many things of excellent use stored up in the lap of nature, having nothing in them kindred to that which is already discovered. So it was in the 19th century. X-rays, for instance, must have seemed fully as magical as the compass did to Bacon. 
though of manifest benefit, they couldn't plausibly have been planned for. A proposal to make flesh transparent wouldn't have appealed to a research director, and even if it had, it surely would not have led to x-rays. What about the 20th century, when there's been a more complex symbiosis between science and technology? In 1937, President Roosevelt commissioned a study aimed at predicting breakthroughs. Its report made salutary reading for today's forecasters. It made wise statements about agriculture, synthetic gasoline, and synthetic rubber, but what's more remarkable is all the things it missed. No nuclear energy, no antibiotics, no jet aircraft, no rocketry nor any use of space, no computers, certainly no transistors. The wisest men of that time overlooked or couldn't foresee the technologies that most dramatically dominated the post-war era. The pace of technology has accelerated since then. Information technology depends on some basic science that's less than 10 years old. Likewise, biotechnology and genetic engineering. A current attempt to predict future breakthroughs might have a hit rate just as dismal as that of the US forecasters in 1937. The most dramatic and fruitful innovations will be the outcome of some new basic science, but we don't know what. Our world is being transformed by innovations which depended on very modest investments in basic research in the past, as Professor Badeev has said. Some programs paid off so colossally that the overall academic research effort was a fine investment, despite many blind alleys. On the football field, not everyone scores. You can't predict who will or when. But that doesn't mean that the other players were dispensable. Likewise, it's essential to maintain a broad science base and strong connections between disciplines. Advances that deepen our understanding of any broad aspect of nature, the physics of materials, living cells, or the environment, or new mathematical ideas, are all likely to find some application. Curiosity-driven research, as it's called, can impact in quite unexpected ways. For instance, it was studies of dust in interstellar space that led to the carbon molecules known as fullerenes and the exotic fauna of the ocean bed may seem as remote as outer space, but their ecology is quite relevant to the safety of waste disposal in the deep ocean. I'd like to devote a few final comments to some global concerns. Nuclear weapons were an invention as different in kind from anything before as gunpowder seemed to Bacon. Some of the physicists who worked at Los Alamos founded, after the war, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, a journal with the aim of alerting the world to the urgency of arms control. The cover page of each issue shows a clock, the closeness of whose hands to zero indicates how precarious the world's situation is thought to be by the editors. At the time of the Cuba crisis, it was at four minutes to midnight, it was back there again in the mid-1980s. The clock has now been put back to about 15 minutes to midnight. And in nuclear terms, the world indeed seems on a longer fuse. But bewildering new threats now confront us. These may not threaten a sudden global catastrophe, and the doomsday clock is perhaps a less apt metaphor, but they are altogether just as challenging. We've got to ensure that the nuclear arsenals are safeguarded and gradually dismantled. We must ensure that new chemical or biological weapons don't proliferate. And this is especially of concern because they require only minor adaptations of technologies that every nation aspires to. But for most of the world's people, the ideological stance of the Cold War was always an irrelevant distraction from the problems of poverty and natural hazard. These Threats without enemies, as I'd call them, relate to global questions of the environment, resources, and biodiversity. There's no case for any 
slowing down or brake on technical innovation. Rather, the need is to accelerate, but somewhat redirect, scientific efforts. The thrust of development must shift in the next century towards a mode that's more environmentally benign and more sustainable. And the obligations to inform and seek solutions extends to the entire international scientific community. Expertise is needed in all the sciences that impinge on these global threats without enemies. These problems that should loom just as large in the political agenda as did the East-West political divide during the Cold War era. My special expertise is in cosmology, so I'll close with a cosmic perspective. The intricate biosphere of which we are part has taken several billions of years to evolve. But in terms of cosmic time spans, we could still be nearer to the beginning than to the culmination of the evolutionary process. And it's primarily collective human actions which will determine how or even if that process continues to unfold here on Earth on what Carl Sagan called that pale blue dot in the cosmos. And being mindful of these potentialities stretches our horizons. It should also deepen our commitment to understand our world. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, historical background opening to an exciting future at an accelerated pace and to give us the uh, relation with time with modesty that we should consider always in our view of science and responsibility. Now we have about 15 minutes for discussion, so while you're preparing some of the questions you want to ask to the panel, I would just like to put one question to you regarding power, of power of science. The title is Using the Power of Science, the Challenges Ahead. What is it, what is the power of a scientist? Is it the power of a lonely scientist plus the media? Is it the power of a scientist plus the industrial application? Is it the power of a scientist plus the politician? What, what is your view, or your short comments on, on a view of, on this? Who wants to start? Yes. Well, I was in fact surprised to see that word power. Uh, I think it's, from my point of view, it's not correct. It should read potential. Uh, because power is something which we may, in general, misinterpret, particularly the public. And science offers a big potential for further development, for uh, sustainable life, uh, all which actually we need will come up stepwise. We don't have it yet. We need more fundamental insights. And this, to my mind, is not a power, but it's an offered potential. And we should just use it very carefully and with big responsibility. I would just say that the power of science is the power of a new idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is of immense power. Galileo was forced to recant but that didn't change the fact that the Earth was no longer the center of the universe. The discovery of a new idea, and it doesn't need the media, it's the idea itself that, that is determinative. Well, the power of science is the power to understand, but it's important that the applications should be determined not by the scientists themselves, but by the wider community, and that's why the scientists have an obligation to inform the wider community of the implications so far as they can judge of all their discoveries. Well, certainly it is the power of ideas that change the world and uh, something that I treasure in science is the willingness to adventure on new ideas in the face of people's uh, criticisms and ridicule and so on. Uh, we should be willing to adventure uh, since we have seen new ideas which seemed ridiculous uh, 50 years ago uh, transform the world. I just wanted to pick up finally a point that was made about Galileo to tie in with the aspect of the power of science that I try to um, illuminate. And that is that uh, Bert Bertolt Brecht wrote a play about the trial of Galileo and the 
play shows uh, Galileo being shown the instruments of torture by the Inquisition, and Galileo did partially recant, as, as we heard. But the point of the play is to say how, appa how appalling this is, uh, and what a betrayal of uh, us all this recantation was. And looking at that play, what impressed me was the moral standards that were being set for science. Uh, I, I would, of course, recant immediately on seeing the instruments of torture. And uh, the thought that there is a wide public that feels that scientists are in possession of something rather holy and should be prepared to suffer torture for it, uh, I think is a very impressive testimonial to one aspect of the power of science. Thank you very much. Let's go question in the middle, then one here and one there after. One, two, three. Four. Yes, uh, my question to the panel is, um, what discoveries in each respective field uh, or what area of research that you are carrying out now or you foresee in the future is going to have a real impact in the way we conduct our lives or in the way um, we operate each day. I heard something from Professor Fadiv uh, about the formulas and when they are supposed to uh, uh, have a better knowledge uh, of, the, of the physics. But uh, I'm missing something about microbiology um, in the, in the area of medicine, for example, I think I would like to hear something more about the genome uh, project and how, we'll, uh, have, how this will have an impact in our lives in the near future. Thanks. That's a very important question. Remember, we have uh, seven minutes remaining, but if some of you want to take just one point and then stress it. Um, I'd like to respond to the question by emphasizing the important cultural role of science for understanding our place in nature. In the 19th century, Darwin did work of no practical application at all, but everyone accepts he changed the way we see our place on the Earth. In the same way, what's happened in astronomy and cosmology is doing this now, and I believe even though the direct applications may seem remote, the cultural changes wrought by these important insights are something which all of us uh, should uh, not uh, downgrade. Well. Well, you propose the question of microbiology. Uh, molecular biology offers already now tools, very important tools, to better understand pathogenicity. That means the pathogenic interactions between microbes, which are pathogens, and the host, which often are humans or animals or plants. And I think with the understanding of these mechanisms, we are on the best way to find also ways for therapy. It's no guarantee. Not in each case we will be successful, but there, I'm sure there will be many cases where really good therapies will be found on the basis of the understanding of these specific interactions between pathogens and its hosts. What about the fight against cancer? Well, I think that there are a number of practical ones, but just to talk about the genetics that you brought up, we will have very shortly the ability to determine the prognosis of an individual tumor by looking at its molecular construct, find out how far it's progressed, and fashion in a boutique way a therapy designed for that treatment. So that's short term for uh, uh, cancer. Over a longer term, we have learned just recently that cancer is in fact a genetic disease. I don't mean an inherited disease. I mean a genetic disease. Some of the genetic changes are inherited, but most of them are due to the environment. And as we learn this and see the changes, we can fashion treatments uh, to, to stop those changes and make, in fact, cancer cells become normal cells. Jean-Daniel Dodgman. Uh, Jean-Daniel Dodgman from France. I have a question for uh, academician Fadeyev about science in Russia. Uh, how do you assess the present situation, and maybe for other members of the panel, 
is science in Russia weakened by the departure of some scientists or on the contrary reinforced by the network you are building all over the world in Europe, in America, in Israel and uh, in other countries? <clears throat> well, about this I could speak for, for an hour. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, science is, uh, in Russia is in a very dear situation now. Uh, even if we compare very meager uh, financing which we had in Soviet time, it diminishes for, for order of magnitude, ten times or even more. And in this sense, uh, the network, the connection of us, of uh, Russian scientists with all the world by means of networking is extremely important. And we get help for that from, uh, from many countries, from France, from Germany, from the United States, and we use this help. And uh, I think that this is one of the reasons why we shall survive. Thank you. What question is, please? Yes, up there. My question relates not to the power of science, but to what I would call the social function of science. Steven Weinberg, in his book, a final, uh, The Dream of the Final Theory, wrote, science provides perhaps the means, but never the motives to kill. I think the civilizing role of science is not yet sufficiently uh, communicated to a large as large number of people as possible. We all use abundantly technology, but there is a gap between technology and the awareness of a new world image, of how the civilizing function of the progress of knowledge to the road of science. Professor Fadayev spoke to us about mathematics as a sixth sense, but this is not accessible to a huge number of people. So my question, because of this social function to bring enlightenment, to bring about a better understanding, and through science to fight against fundamentalism, against obscurantism, my question perhaps to Monsieur de Ronay, who is uh, himself doing a lot in order to communicate all these ideas, principles of science at the new world image, we are privileged here to have access to you gentlemen and to be at the forum. But hundreds of millions, if not more of people, are they aware of what you just told us, of what we have learned here? How can we do better, and I'm addressing myself to the distinguished panel, and in particular to you, Monsieur de Ronay, how can we do more in order so that science fulfills this important social function in our time? We're looking forward to the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. I will let the members of the panel answer. I will say education, uh, education, and education is the strategic question of the 21st century. And information and, and uh, training is the, is the key. And, but but uh, somebody, some, do you want to say something? Well, yes. I mean, there are two things uh, that come to mind. Uh, one is uh, we can do it through declarations, and we do declarations about the responsibility of scientists, uh, which uh, should be set high. And uh, we can do it through action. And uh, increasingly, uh, scientists are coming out of the laboratories from time to time and engaging in well, working as citizens, but citizens who have been privileged to have a particular advanced education, which is relevant, and citizens who are, as I said earlier, members of an international community, uh, which is a, a trusting community. It would be impossible for scientists to check the uh, experimental or theoretical claims of every other scientist before using them, science advances by people believing each other. And, uh, and we set high standards and uh, uh, we uh, therefore have a basis for, I mentioned Bosnia, uh, there an action was taken last summer by a group of scientists who went to uh, meet their counterparts in Sarajevo 
and uh, to discuss what they might do to strengthen democracy there. It may sound like a tall order, but uh, it's, it's a very reasonable undertaking, and I was touched when we arrived to find that, first of all, we were the first group of scientists, international group, to have been for a while, and uh, secondly, the head of their Academy of Sciences, who at once put us in touch with the political leaders of the country, but first greeted us warmly, and then he turned to us and said, where have you been? And uh, he was perfectly clear that we had an obligation to stay in touch and to give every support we could. We hadn't done so. But uh, anyway, that's my answer to your question. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry for Mike Nelson and his question, but we are at one minute to the end. And I would like to ask each of you in one sentence, if you would be the minister of uh, research of your country with a limited but significant budget, what would be the priority that you, you would pick up for the next 20 years? for the pr next 20 years? Well, I attach much importance to interdisciplinary work, and I would give a priority to interdisciplinary approaches for studies of complex systems and evolutive processes, because I'm sure, I'm convinced that this kind of thing will give a better insight into the process by which life develops and in a system where the universe is developing steadily. And that will lead us away from fundamentalism. Thank you, Ludwig Fadeyev. Well, excuse me, I just don't believe in this possibility. Oh, you don't believe in it, it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> because of the limited budget from Samuel Herman. I would say that um, I have a more practical uh, view toward this. Um, if I had a limited uh, but significant budget, I would devote it to infectious disease. There's a mistake ab uh, ab abroad, and that is that infectious disease is over with. The major killer in the world is malaria. We've heard about AIDS. Uh, there's hepatitis and the development of hepatomas. There's uh, the mad cow disease and prion diseases. These are curable understandable, and it won't take that long. So I'd put a lot of effort into those. Well, in view of the unpredictability of the consequences of new scientific understanding, if I was Minister of Science, I'd keep my mouth shut. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I would do nothing. Uh, I would spend this large sum of money that has been offered by our chairman on those scientists who are most likely to change thinking over a broad area and showed promise of delivering. I would try to keep my gaze fixed on the frontiers where you can expect something fundamentally new. And there are three of those. The very small, the very big, and the very complex. Well, thank you very much. The three infinite. The infinitely small, the infinitely large, and the infinitely complex. As you see, science is building the knowledge society of tomorrow, and the network society would be one of its backbones for the future. Let's hope that science will bring peace and help to catalyze the emergence of collective intelligence. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.